Let's get ready to rumble! Yeah, lots of talks with, with Javante Davis. I mean, firstly, those two going back and forth. And, you know, I've spoken to Javante personally, and he'll be receiving an offer from us today for that fight as well. I think it's a huge fight. Could happen in the UK, but we're looking in America. You know, you've got two fiery characters. Javante is an outstanding fighter. Super featherweight, really, coming up to lightweight and boxing at 140, but never boxed at 147. And it's a really tough fight for Conor Ben. I mean, Javante is a pound for pound great. But I like the size advantage in that fight. You know, it'll be the first time, as I said, for a couple of fights that he'll be fighting someone smaller than him. But he can really crack, and he's an outstanding fighter. So it's a big ask for Conor, but this is what he wants. He wants those kind of tests. And I think Javante Davis against Conor Ben is a fight that can really light up America and the UK. What sort of time frame are you looking at in terms of month of year? April time. It has to sit within the schedule, of course, but April, May, something like that. You know, I think Javante has been looking for a date for a while now. Conor Ben, fresh, ready to go after those 12 rounds. Let's make it happen. Eddie was looking at April or May in the UK or the USA. Well, Connor's got licensing issues over here, but the board only get one shot at the appeal, and I believe the result of the appeal should be rendered soon. I don't see some appeal that they win, and then they'll have no choice but to license Connor. So it could happen, but it's all about scheduling and timing because April or May is when Eddie was looking to put the fight on. Would it sell in America? I was saying Connor's not a big draw, but would it have to sell in America? It all depends on the time scheduling. You know, I have a feeling that a sizable contingency of the British audience, whether it's um, 4 a.m. or they pull it back a little earlier to accommodate the time zone over here. I have a feeling, you know, the numbers that it may lack in America could be compensated by the numbers it does in the UK. Eddie was saying it'd be good for Connor to have the weight advantage because his last opponents were bigger. But if Tank has put rehydration clauses on Barrios and Ryan Garcia, he might do the same to Connor or make it at a catch weight. How much are they willing to compromise to make the fight? Connor and Eddie is the question. Is Connor just like the go to guy now? Because Bill Haney was post fight after Connor outpointed Pete Davison, weekend gone, giving him props, saying that his family, referring to his dad, are legends in the game and they'd like to make a fight. It was the performance you would like, but we know that you're a, a real player in the game, so I want to come over here and tell you congratulations. And, you know, maybe we can do something. Listen, you know, I'm king for that fight. Hey, listen, all due respect, brother. No, you know what I mean? Thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Hopefully. Listen. I'm ready, I'm ready to go. All know, respect I'm to you and yeah. your family, you, you are, yeah. guys are uh, a, a legend, legends in the sport. And of course it will be an honor and a pleasure if that time presents itself. And you know what I mean, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, no, thank you, you for coming. Thank you guys for inviting me. No, I appreciate it. But it seems funny that after Bill makes a informal but face-to-face -face approach that Tank makes his pitch, saying after that last performance, all he needs is a couple of weeks and a weekend in Turks, and he'll be ready to give Connor that work. Now, Floyd Mayweather and Haney's have been going back and forth, but that's nothing uncommon across the pond. They're always going back and forth. Not many fights are produced off the back and forth, but they're going back and forth. So, you know, are they trying to get one over on the Haney's? Look, we got the fight before you. Because you never know with TMT. Ryan was declaring that Floyd was his advisor. The negotiations for... The Haney fight broke down after Ryan told the world that he's going to be fighting Roley. The next thing TMT announced, Roley versus Pitbull Cruz. Ryan got played. Is Tank wasting everyone's time? It would be better if a representative from TMT was talking for him. Either Floyd or Leonard. He might be able to take it a little more serious. But Eddie sent the offers off. I keep hearing talk of people saying that I should retire or I'm going to retire soon or whatever. I ain't retiring anywhere. I've got two fights with Usyk for the Undisputed, twice. Then I'm going to fight AJ at least once, maybe twice, if there's a rematch, if he wants one, after the first battle I give him. And then I'm going to fight Ngannou again. And that's just a start. So there's five little fights for you to uh, whet your appetite with. This is one receipt that came about last year. The AJ fight was dead 
after he lost to Usyk twice and a fat man. He's not fighting AJ. And then today, total change of mind. The inconsistency is baffling. All these people saying I should retire. I'm going to fight Usyk twice. Then he's going to have two fights with AJ, depending if AJ wants another fight after the first battering he gives him. And then in Garnu. So that's six fights. The first thing I said is, oh no. <laughs> I was hoping Fury would retire. I really was, because he's exhausting. So that's six potential fights that we have to endure. Tick tock, tick tock. Take out the rematch clause, or I'm not going to fight. I want a bigger slice of the purse. More pullouts. I was hoping he'd retire, because it's exhausting. It's exhausting. But it's no shock. <laughs> it's no shock. How about we get this Usyk fight over the line, May the 18th first? We could look at the rematch. And then talk about other fights. You know what I mean? One fight at a time is the best plan of action. Caroline Dubois wouldn't have took her last fight on Boxer if she knew she could fight for that vacant IBF title against the Dixon girl. She wouldn't have took the fight. Now let's not get, you know, caught in some boxing linguistics. She took the fight to disqualify herself from fighting Beatrice Ferreira. And it's known in the industry that Ferreira is a more formidable task than... Dixon. And it's cropping up too much for the media just to keep ignoring it. It's just boxing fans like me and the other regular YouTubers who are picking up on this. But she's basically turned down a world title shot and she'll get another title at one of the other vacant titles that Katie Taylor has relinquished. But how many times now have Boxer come up short at making fights against matron fighters? Now, Fabio Wardley's not a matron fighter, he's a free agent, but that's who was repping for him in the purse bid between him and Fraser Clark. Now, the fight's going to happen, but, you know, they pulled out of the fight on the day of the purse bid, just like they did with Jai Opatai and React Poor. Caroline disqualified herself from fighting Beatrice Ferreira because you can't take an interim fight if you're nominated to fight for one of their straps. Just like Jai Opatai couldn't take an interim fight and keep hold of his strap. But this is a different situation, isn't it, really? I mean, Jai's already beat Bradis. And it was Bradis who wasn't ready to fight Jai on the Day of Reckoning in December. He needed more time to get himself together. Jai was ready. So he fought Elis Zorro instead. Not out of choice, but out of necessity. He's got to stay busy as a young fighter. How much was Caroline getting paid for her last fight on Boxer? Not more than what she would have got for a Beatrice Ferreira fight. Jai was getting paid a fortune in Saudi Arabia. And he was a champion. And word on the street, his next fight will be against Bradis for the same belt anyway. So it's two different situations. Then you've got Chef Clark, mandatory for Isaac Chamberlain, who is a Mick Hennessy fighter. And Mick Hennessy is basically reinforcing Ben Shalom's boxer cards on Sky with his roster. But they're talking about Isaac Chamberlain versus Vidal Riley. Vidal Riley is not mandated Chef Clark is and Chev's up for the fight and Isaac ain't scared of Chev well I hope he isn't that's another fight and then we've got Dalton Smith who's been mandated for Adam Azim's European title at 140 Eddie said he's got huge money for Adam Azim and they're talking about holding it in Hillsborough because the Pakistan crowd English crowd and everyone outside who likes boxing are going to flock to that fight. When Eddie said Hillsborough, I was shocked. But if that's what he's saying, that's what he's saying. It's a big, big fight. I believe it's for European, Commonwealth and British. So what's going to happen now? Our boxer just going to vacate the light welter titles, the cruiserweight titles because of what? It doesn't make sense at this stage here. And the media are not highlighting what's going on. It's not a good look for British boxing. It really isn't. The prize fighter tournament returns to Matchroom. New, improved, and updated. Matchroom presents the prize fighter in Japan. The weight limit, middleweight, 160 pounds. Britain's Mark Dickinson, Kieran Conway. Ireland's Aaron McKenna. China's Anawir Yelenazzi. The French middleweight, Anuel. Spare me the indignity trying to pronounce that surname. From Puerto Rico, Giovanni Estella, and Japan's Ryoko Kiyomoto. 
Yeah, so um, it begins on March the 31st. We go straight into the quarterfinals. Eight-man tournament. It will be no longer three rounds a fight. It's 10 rounds, and I believe the final will be 12 rounds. Now, they want knockouts. The tournament is trying to encourage knockouts with a £100,000 bonus for a stoppage or knockout. Man's going to be throwing hands in there. <laughs> it's a £1 million jackpot for the winner and a world title fight. NSN and Rakuten in conjunction with the prize fighter eight-man middleweight tournament. Probably a bit lazy not renaming it because the prize fighter tournament, as us traditionalists knew it, was a free round of fight tournament. A lot of people are saying Aaron McKenna, one half of the McKenna brothers, Aaron and Stevie, they're saying he's the favourite. I don't know. Aaron's a little open to me, man. He's a little open. I think there's still a place for the free round of fight format as well. The original prize fighter. The original just needs a few tweaks. Maybe they could up the levels because sometimes it was inconsistent. You know, like Audley Harrison won it twice. And while a lot of people are not geeked about his career, he was way too talented for most of the opponents who were put in front of him in the tournament. Like I said, some men were literally coming off the building site. Literally. But you know, you got the likes of Gavin Reese. He won it. World champion. British champion. But yeah, the prize fighter tournament in Japan, apart from being too lazy to change the name, looks good. So it could be back on, but it's just sources currently. Michael Coppinger's. Devin Haney is set to defend his WBC 140 pound world title against Ryan Garcia. Now, Devin, 25 years of age, 31 and 0, 15 inside the distance, former undisputed lightweight champion against Ryan Garcia, 25 years of age, 24 and 1 with 20 inside the distance. They're saying it's about a done deal. And Golden Boy, from what I'm hearing, have just had enough of Ryan. You know what I mean? Sink or swim. You win this. You make yourself look good. You make Golden Boy look good. Witness protection is out. No hiding behind Floyd. No more little boy tantrums. Let's get the fight made. Eddie Hearn said it's the right fight for Devin. The right fight for DeZone. Devin told Ryan to make him a proper offer. And Ryan is sending messages to Eddie. Eddie said he's not negotiating with Ryan. He's talking to the relevant parties, which will be Delahoya and Robert Diaz. Ryan is a hype job, in my opinion. It shouldn't be this big fuss about Ryan challenging for a belt. He's not the champion. He never has been a champion. But with his social media following and the hype surrounding him, it will be good exposure for Devin, definitely so. They say they were free of peace in the amateurs, but Devin has advanced and progress since then where Ryan hasn't made the improvements that Devin has in no way, shape or form. He's avoided Devin before at 135 when Devin had a WBC strap. But he does have a puncher's chance, I guess. You can give him that. We'll wait for confirmation. Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney, let's talk about that. I know that's a fight you wanted to make and it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Ryan went training with Floyd, all yeah. of a sudden wanted Roley, Roley fights someone else and now it's like yeah, go on then. It seems to be on. What can you tell yeah, us? It's very close. I mean, Bill Haney's leading that um, from our side with DHP and Matchroom. He's been talking to Oscar non-stop. Um, the, the path has been quite clear. Ryan reached out to me on multiple occasions to say he wants to fight. And I don't know him well enough to believe him, but he was good to his word. And uh, as I understand it now, speaking to Bill last night, the fight is close. Let's see what happens over the next couple of days. Massive fight. Massive Great fight for DAZN. Massive fight for Devin, massive fight for Ryan. The kind of fights that should be getting made, so fingers crossed. Not a good night for Jose Pedraza, 34-year-old veteran, 29-6-1, a former super featherweight titleist. Hasn't had a win in his last four. He's fought the likes of Jose Ramirez, Richard Come, Vasil Lomachenko, Tank Davis, and more. And he was stopped by top-ranked prospect Keyshawn Davis. 10 and 0, 7 inside the distance, 24 years of age. The 10 year age gap really looked evident yesterday. And the fact that for some reason Pedraza chose to drop down to 135, when since 2019, in his last several or eight fights, he's been at 140, wasn't a good move. Really wasn't a good move. Why these older fighters do that? I don't know. I don't know. 
The aging fighter suffers a dip in form and they're searching and they're searching. Maybe I need to go back down to 135. What for exactly? Keyshawn's body punching wasn't something I was um, expecting to be so impressive. But yeah, he hooked to the body viciously and he took the starch out of Pedraza's legs. Pedraza, I think his game plan was to attack Keyshawn's body and smother him out, but he couldn't close the pocket. He couldn't close the pocket and him just plodding forward like that just left him open to the counters and Keyshawn, he varied up the speed as he walked Pedraza into traps. Some nasty uppercuts went in there, some hard hooks to the head. Pedraza was bleeding everywhere and taking a battering and I think in the third he was hurt for the first time and in the seventh Keyshawn finished it clinically clinical finish I think Pedraza wanted to protest but he was wise not to he knew he was thoroughly beaten thoroughly beaten best win of Keyshawn's career so far you know he was calling out Teofimo Lopez and after Tio's fight with Jermaine Tio was leaning over the ropes and they were going back and forth I don't think he's going to happen next. Look, man, Lou DiBella, Terence Crawford, Michael Benson, John Scully, Tim Bradley are a few of the industry who don't believe Teofimo Lopez deserved to retain his 140-pound title yesterday. And I'm definitely one of them as well. 117, 111. 115, 113 twice. Nah, I just can't see that. I can't see that. Christine Poncha and Michaela Mayor on the commentary duties were totally inept and biased, incompetent. I wasn't impressed one bit. They seemed to just ignore Ortiz's work. Ortiz would land and they'd just ignore the work and go to when Tio was landing or what Ortiz wasn't doing. Now, they did acknowledge the fight was in the balance at the end. They did acknowledge that. But the commentary was horribly biased and some were saying that Tim Bradley... Even though he scored it for Ortiz. He was making excuses for Tio all the way through. You know, Tio couldn't cut the ring off. Yeah. He was throwing one punch at a time. The speed advantage, and I'm talking foot speed, hand speed, all belonged to Ortiz. He couldn't miss that straight left from the southpaw stance all night, flushing Tio's face. The spin move he was doing, well, it's subjective. Like Lennox pointed out on the hangar I did post-fight. When Lomachenko does it, the referees don't seem to get involved. But the referee warned Jermaine, and he kept doing it, and it looks like the referee didn't know if he should admonish him or not, and he stopped admonishing him. Although Jermaine wasn't doing it as much after he was warned. He was just spinning around him. He wasn't actually using his hand to spin him. He was just outmaneuvering him. Every time, he'd just roll out to his right. Every time, Tio tried to trap him. He was normally first to the punch. The hand speed difference was glaring absolutely glaring like Tio did well in the round there was a head clash and Ortiz started bleeding from a cut the cornerman done a magnificent job the cut never opened up again it looked pretty bad but it never opened up again it is a bad scorecard I didn't like Ortiz's style from an aesthetic argument but it's amazing how many people think that throwing ad hominems at the runner negates the fact that he outpointed and outscored Tio easily in there. Easily. Just easy to score. Hey, people, people, humans, humans, listen up, man. Listen up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all can boo all you want. Suck a dick, no homo. Listen, I know, relax, relax. Let me, let me, let me go back on this, okay? We cannot... For one second, let me speak. We cannot for one second claim these people, these fighters that don't want to come and fight. You go to blood, sweat, and tears, the three code of conduct, Sugar Ray Robinson Award. If you ain't ready for this life, get the out of my sport. I am a champion. I bleed for this. I sweat for this, and I cry for this every time. Jesus is real. And, and all I can say, May God giveth, God taketh, blessed be. Hey, people, humans. He really tries to be this enigmatic talker and he just hasn't got it. He's just not an articulate cat. And, you know, you put him in with a southpaw with decent movement, a decent jab like Sandor Martin and Jermaine Ortiz. He's got all types of issues. 
And then when he got booed, the whole sucker dick, no homo thing. You know, I, I don't know, Tia. Too focused on Eddie Hearn, too focused on Terence Crawford. Looks like he's got to get his mind on the job. But he's got the mandatory out of the way. They better select very carefully the next voluntary or that belt will be gone. Make sure they get a plodder who's screaming, hit me, hit me, hit me. Get one of them type of opponents. I think Jermaine Ortiz and his team were naive to think that boxing operates on you score more points to someone and you get the verdict. He didn't win no new fans with his performance and he goes home without the belt. It is what it is, you know, and um, I know some people are going to disagree, but the whole, you've got to take it from the champion. No, it's not in Queensbury rules that you have to do that, but what it's trying to tell you is if you're a challenger against the champion, you want to wrench that shit out of his arm and put it beyond dispute. Because a few people are going to argue that Jermaine won by Saturday and the bell rings for a, a fresh batch of fights, it will be forgotten. And that's that. When you get your title opportunity, you got to think about what you're doing. What is likely to work and what's likely not to work. Or he could just be happy that Terence Crawford thought he won, that Lou DiBella thought he won, that Michael Benson thought he won, that I thought he won, that a lot of people thought he won. Well, yeah, cool. As long as you're happy with that, then don't change nothing. I'm not making a judgment. It's a decision. People have decisions to make in life. The reason they say you've got to take it from the champ because in the old school, if you fought like Jermaine Ortiz, you wouldn't be booked no more to fight. The promoters would not use you. They'd use you as a sparring partner. He was the sort of boxer, Tommy, who could give anybody a fight, go the distance with anybody. A little bit of a spoiler. He could make people look bad if he wanted sure. to. There's a lot of good left hand work going on in this, which is something you don't often see in these, these old heavyweight championship and fights. He's not running, he's right there fighting with him. He's, he's very range. clever. He's in range to get hit, but he's very elusive and he's moving. People nowadays probably say he's spoiling he's running. It's just you know, nowadays they would run. Now this is what you call boxing, what Mr. Fogg is doing. He's coming forward, he's jabbing, he's not going backwards. He's making a fight because back in these days, if a gentleman were to run and stink the place out, he perhaps wouldn't get paid. Mmm.